Picking up on our next lesson about soul winning or public ministry, which I like. But uh, it is found, soul winning is found in the Bible. So back to Proverbs 11, verse 30. Our opening verse on soul winning. And today we're going to pick up some more topics, some ideas, thoughts, what the Bible says. Uh, the other lessons can be found on YouTube and found on uh, SoundCloud and other resources that we have on the internet. And not the end of the time, you know, looking back what we've already done, let's move on and you can get the other videos. And just giving you a little time to find Proverbs 11.30. It says, the fruit of the righteous, which we talked about through previous, is a tree of life. And he that win his souls is wise. And we talked about the wisdom. It's an extra wisdom that you get from God by doing what God has told you to do. So today we're going to set forth now into why we should soul win. Why does God tell us go in all the world and preach the gospel? Why? It's got to be a reason. God does not give us something to do just to keep us to do something. That's the world. So when we go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, Genesis 2, verse 7, all the way back to where God created man. In Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust. So we're not an evoluted product. We are not the offspring of a big bang. We are made by a creator. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So we have the trinity of man, a body, which is dirt, ground, earth. We'll go back to that if the Lord tarries. We have the air, we have the spirit, which God breathed into man. Our breath comes from God. When we inhale, that comes from God. The moment that God says, I'm done, you, you, you're not going to live no more. You're going to... And if God's done with you, you're not going to breathe no more. And yet the air that we breathe has come from someone else. Comes from a dog, comes from a pig, comes from a snake. And yet God has given us life through breath. And then man became a living soul. That living soul that man has is an eternal soul. That the Bible says there is life after death. It's either heaven or it's hell. There's nowhere else. There's no limbo. There's no uh, purgatory. There's no whatever you want to call it. Navina or any other makeup word in the music industry. Utopia. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And our living souls, after we take our last breath, will enter off into the eternal. Whether to heaven by Jesus Christ or by hell by anything but Jesus Christ. And our bodies will be put into the grave. Yes, if the Lord tarries. But for the Christian, when the Lord comes for his bride, those there, let's look at that. Second, I see a second Thessalonians 4, first Thessalonians 4. I know it's a Thessalonians 4, and it can't be second. First Thessalonians 4, stretching out more into what I've had in this thing is 413, first Thessalonians. But I would not have you to be ignorant. Rather than current sin, concerning them which are asleep, that died. For a Christian that, that dies, the Bible calls it a sleep, a nap, a rest. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. You know, we're going to miss those people that die. But we're not going to cry because, oh, where they're going to go, we don't have no idea. If they confess and done what the Bible has certified for them to do on the faith of Jesus Christ alone, you can look into that coffin and say, hey, I'll see you later. I'll see you in the gates of New Jerusalem. And you're going to cry for weeping. I've had many lost family members go off into to be with Jesus. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, I do, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we, while we are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. So, the breath goes back to God. The soul goes off into eternity. And yet, and yet, for the Christian, there's coming a day when the Lord is going to come for his bride and those bodies are going to come out of those graves. And they're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Then we'll get a new body, a new fashioned body, a sinless body, a body that will not ever break down. As with the lost man that goes off into hell with his soul, his body will join him at Revelation chapter 20 at the great white throne judgment. And him and his body as a worm will be cast off in the lake of fire that burneth forever. And there's no recorded of that breath, that spirit, just the body and the soul. God made that. And John chapter 3, our creator, our creator, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God, our creator, so loved the world. Okay, monkey man. Where is the original ape, and does he love you, and has he ever done anything for you? Where is that ape? Where is that monkey? Where is that fish? Where is that big bang to do something to give you hope? Oh, I hope in a million years that we will do, and you're not ever going to be around. You're going to be in the dirt rotten. And then you'll find out, prepare to meet that God. You'll find out that there is a God, and that God is the creator, and that evolution is a lie. That's your hope. And it ain't really the blessed hope as Jesus Christ. So, man is a body, soul, and spirit. And at death, the body gets buried, gets eliminated, gets dusted, whatever you do with the body. The spirit returns back to God. Saved or lost, that's God's spirit. You are breathing on God's terms. And your soul. Your soul goes off to be with God. Or it goes off to be into hell. On your profession, what you do or what you don't do with Jesus Christ. The Bible says for a Christian that dies to be absent from the body. There it is. There's that right here. Ouch. Body. Itchy. Ugly. And present with the Lord. That moment your soul departs. And I've heard some stories. I don't know if they're true or not. You know, that people seeing the souls coming out of the body. Not, but the, there is no time frame from that moment you take that last breath. You are with God. Jesus Christ. So why? Number one, man is a living soul. And he has the eternal soul. Now next, Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Why? Got to be a reason. All right, man has an eternal soul. Man's going to die. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. God speaking. What Verse 3. As I live, saith the Lord God. Ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You know what God says? God says, that is my soul that you have. And since it's my soul, and since I love you enough, I sent my Son. In charge of your soul is what I have set forth on where you will choose your soul to go will be based upon what I've told you to do with that soul. What I've told you to do with those lips. What I've told you to do with that heart. So that soul man we're looking at, that eternal part, the soul never dies. From the time that you've been conceived in the womb of your mother and father, that moment, People say that life is not life. Okay, it's a soul. It begins in your mother's womb. 
And from that point that that woman conceives that child, now it may be a stillbirth, it may die two months, it may die two years, 20 years, 90 years. The soul of that person, that being, male or female, is eternal and will populate a woman that gives birth, that has a seed inside of her, of a man, will populate heaven or hell one day. And that soul belongs to God. Now when you get into Narvila and you get into this other mystical junk and religions, you have turned your soul over to Satan. Because religions are never God. Religions are man-made. Jesus Christ is God approved when it comes to that soul. Now let's take our Bibles to Romans 6.23 and notice, notice please with this study, I don't know if you can see me doing this, but I am churning my King James Bible with you. And I hope you've heard me say, with, if it's my opinion, I will say, I think, I'm not sure, I don't know. And when you hear me say, I think, I'm not sure, I don't know, you can take that and throw it in the garbage can. Okay? But if I'm reading to you and you are turning with your Bible, and I hope you have a King James Bible. If not, go get one and you can get these on the internet. Reread Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. You go to work, you put 40 hours in, you put 20 hours in, 10 hours in, 5 hours, 1 hour, half hour. Do you expect a check, whether it be that week or two weeks or monthly, however you're paid, do you expect a check for the hours that you put in for your employer? Of course you expect a check. And yet, sin that has come by man, by disobeying the word of God, when God said, do not eat of that fruit, and they ate of that fruit, and we are born in sin, we are sinners. That God the Creator made our body, made our soul, made our spirit, has given us life. And that soul that belongs to God. And we are all sinners for all have sinned and come short the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. I'm a sinner by birth. I did not need to be taught on how to lie to my mother about not stealing that cookie. No one ever taught me to say, well, who broke that lamp? Uh, the dog did it. And even before I could talk, the times when I would cry just to get attention from my mother and I didn't need to be changed and I wasn't hungry. I just cried just to aggravate her. That's a sinner. We're all sinners. I have at least taken a paper clip from work. I've stolen. I have told a lie. I have bared false witness. I have not always been a good child to my parents. I have not honored my mother and father. I have never, ever, in the day of my life, from the, from the time that I was born to today, I have never put God first all the time. I violated the first commandment. I was a Roman Catholic. I did the idolatry. And the Bible says I shall not have any idols in my heart. I just go on and on and on. I'm a sinner. So those sins that I have done, the wages I get paid from my sins is death. And a man that has never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior is also going to die because he's also a sinner and he earns those wages. So, man is created by God the Creator. The Creator loves us. Ezekiel says that that soul that's in me, that I believe, you may not believe, but I believe I have a soul, belongs to God. And as a result, God can set the standard for my soul whether I go into eternity of hopefulness and blessfulness and wonder and amazement or I can go off into eternity of damnation, condemnation, and torments. 
God can set that standard for the soul. And when we read now, because we are sinners, there is death. And we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the wages of sin brings the death. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 told us that death for a Christian is sleep. And the body sleeps in the grave even if you are in hell. Luke 16. There's so much I did not get in this report that we're getting now. Luke 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died. It was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. I can't explain that. That's, I don't, that's not church age. We don't go to Abraham's bosom. Today we go from absent from the body and present with the Lord. Christ has not died. He has not been buried. He's not risen from the grave yet. But watch the rich man. The rich man also died. Anybody dies. And was buried. We bury, most cases we bury the bodies. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. Uh-oh. His body's in the grave. But the Jehovah Witnesses can't understand that the eyes are in hell. Being in torment. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cries and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. The soul has a tongue. Whether you're in heaven or you're in hell. You have eyes, you have a tongue, so our soul is a complete me inside of me. And when I am saved and gone from this body and to be present with the Lord, I will see the Lord with my eyes. I will hear the Lord with my ears. I will smell of the Lord with my nose. I will talk to the Lord with my tongue. I will feel the Lord with my hands. I will walk with the Lord with my feet. My soul has the appendages that my body has. As well as a soul that is in hell has the same thing. Eyes, fingers, nose, and toes. I have an amputated toe off my foot from diabetes. When I step on the gates before the gates of New Jerusalem and walk the street of gold, I will have ten toes, no longer nine. I feel an itch. I feel a burning where that toe was. And they call it phantom pain. I call it the soul. And that soul belongs to God. Look what else here he says. This man in hell while we're here... Um, Verse 28 of Luke 16. I have five brethren that have... I have five brethren. He has his memory. He remembers his family. He remembers the name of Lazarus. That's our soul. When we die, when that body has been buried, as this man's body has been buried, our soul goes off into heaven or goes off into hell, which is owned by God. Which death is brought to us by sin. And we are created and loved by God the Father. So John 3.36. John 3.36. And then we're talking about why go so winning. We see a foreverness of man living forever. And we just saw in Luke 16, one of them is in torments his entire life while his body is buried in the grave. Now, no Jehovah's Witness will believe that. They believe hell is in the grave, and when you open up the grave of a body, flames don't come shooting out. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son, Jesus Christ, has everlasting life. So when we go preach Jesus to a lost and dying world, we are preaching everlasting life to be with Jesus and God in heaven. 
He that believeth not the Son, Jesus, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abiding upon him. Now that verse looks like, well, a man that dies, well, he doesn't live forever anymore. Well, that would contradict Luke 16. And you say, well, Brother Haber, how do you get over that? Hell is so bad and so tormentful that according to the Holy Spirit, there is no life when you live in hell. Though you're living. People say, oh, I'm going to party in hell. There is no party in hell. There is no living in hell. It is called the wrath of God. And who wants to live that? Though you will live. And when it comes to life, the Holy Spirit says, life, oh, if you'd just be so wonderful by the Son, if you were to believe on the Son. There is eternal life, but in hell, that's not really a life to live. I mean, would you really want to say yourself today, I'm going to live 70, 80 years, all right, in this flesh right now. Would you want to say, oh, I'm going to set my life right now. I'm going to be an alcoholic drunk for the rest of my life. I'm going to live a life as a drunkard. What kind of life is that? I'm going to live the life, you know, uh, of druggy and all that and just waste my entire life doing all kinds and every kind of drug. So be a life of a druggie. Okay, you're going to be living 70, 80, 60 years, how many years? You are living, the, is that really a life? You can say, okay, I'm going to live the life of a CEO, and I'm going to be in part of this entire corporation. I'm going to swindle people. I'm going to deceive people. I'm not going to care about my family. I'm going to cheat on my family. I'm going to go for the gusto. I'm going to go for it all and be unhappy and miserable. But you've got the life of a CEO. You've got the life of someone's got money, and your family's broken. You're broken. You're taking prescription pills, not illegal pills, and you're drinking to get the good times and all that. What kind of life is that? All right, another life. I'm going to set up, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to do right, I'm going to pay my bills, I'm going to love my wife, I'm going to love my children, I'm going to do with the best ability I can, and that'd be a life of happiness and joy. And you'll have problems, you'll have things to go wrong, that's life itself. But then you can say, listen, you know what, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to pay my bills, I'm going to especially love my wife, especially love my children. I'm going to do the best ability to help them to grow in the Lord. We're saved. We're wonderful. We're going to earn, try to get my family to, at the judgment seat of Christ to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Try to get them to earn some crowns and maybe go out there and get, get some cities and just love the Lord and do great and venture eating more and day and all like that. And that's a life to live, to forever to be with the one that suffered and died and created you. Now, that's a wonderful life. Those other lives, you die without Jesus Christ, you die not believing on God, you don't get the hope, you go off into hell, you burn forever. That's not really life, is it? Stop any 200 men and say, listen, you like to have a life of complete destruction and ruin. End up sleeping underneath a bridge. And how many would raise their hand? Yeah, I like that. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. There's everlasting life for all, but God, the Holy Spirit says, it is a better life. To go to heaven by Jesus Christ. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. It is miserable. It is rotten. It's eternal, but it's not really life. But the wrath of God, lake of fire, which abideth on him. Abideth on him. It's not going to go away. It's not like you go to hell and you got a vacation. Ha, ha, ha. And we pack up and go home. That is your home. So, we've got... A creator that made man. He made a soul. It belongs to God. We are going to die. And John the Baptist tells us that there's two lives. There's the eternal life. By the son. And there's the wrath of God. God. Without the son. Do you seriously. Would want someone to go to hell. And burn for it. Uh, let's listen. You take the person that you love the most today, right now. Would you really want to see them in flames forever and ever? How would you put it this way? Let's say they died in a house fire. Or they died in a car wreck that burned. I, I witnessed that too. 
How would you like to go from the from the flames of earth and die with that agony and pain and enter into eternal fire forever? Would you want them not to ever have that lasting damnation? Would you like to go off to, let's just say for a moment, the better place? Well, that's why we go out and soul win. That's why we tell, we tell them about heaven. We tell them about the hope of Jesus Christ so they can get a wonderful, great life. And yet the other side of that coin is there's the wrath of God that bites us forever. There's a hell. There's a lake of fire coming if you will not believe on Jesus. There is torment coming. There is your soul going forever. There are two places that God has settled for a dead man, for his eternal soul. It is heaven or it's hell. And we need to tell them Romans chapter 10 verse 14. I get excited. I hope I'm getting you excited to go out and tell others. John 10, I mean Romans 10, 14. Mouth well, getting dry. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? That's the unsaved man. How shall they believe in him, Jesus, of whom they have not heard. How shall they hear without a preacher? And forgive me for the stupid phone. All right, forgive me. So, would be interruptions, wouldn't there be? He might be leaving a message, who knows? I apologize for that. So, Romans 10 14, let's read that again. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him and whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So the lost man that's going to get the wrath of God, whether he knows it or not, he is, well, how do I call on him? How do I believe on him? I've never been told. Romans 10, 14. What do I need to be saved? Well, you need Jesus Christ. But how does the verse end? It says, you need a preacher. The lost man needs a preacher. He has no idea where he's going. He has no hope. He is a sinner. Under the wrath of God. And the love of our creator. The love of our God. Who has saved our souls. Tells us to go ye in all the world. And preach the gospel to the lost. So that the lost man. At the great white throne judgment. Will say well. How should I call on you, Lord? No one ever told me. I had no idea. And God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, will say, Do you remember that time you got that little piece of paper from that person that handed it to you? That you yelled at him. You cussed at him. Well, in that piece of paper was the words of life. You remember when you sat down in that public bathroom, there was that little comic book that you threw in the garbage can. And that was telling you how you may know about eternal life. Remember that invite you got from that person to come to church? You remember that guy who screamed and hollered at you on the street corner? You remember the people that came knocking at your door that weren't Jehovah Witnesses with a King James Bible? You remember all that? I sent them all in the world to preach the gospel that people like you may get saved. And there have been many people, many people who have disregarded that and they have gone the broad way that goes into destruction. And as a result of the public ministry, there are few people that will adhere to God, who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked that, about that last week with the sower and the seed. And they do love the Lord, and they do get saved, and they do do what God says, and they go out. 
So why do we have a public ministry soul winning? It's because the lost people do not know and will not know and cannot know and will not seek God. Look at Romans chapter 3. We'll be back to 10 in a minute. Oh, Romans chapter 3. See what the Bible says about us going out preaching to them. Let me find this real quick. Romans 3. Romans 3. Oh, where is it? I found 310. 3. But there's one place in Romans 3. Well, verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They don't fear God. They don't really, listen, what the world's telling them about God, here is verse 11. There is none that understand it. Because no one's told them yet, maybe. Maybe they have been told. They don't want to believe. But there is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. There is all gone out the way. They are to, together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. The average lost man is not going to show up before God and say, God, here I am. What do I do? And if he does, he's to have that preacher, Romans chapter 10, to tell him the gospel, not about anything else but the gospel, that Jesus Christ suffered and died according to the scriptures and was buried and arose again the third day according to the scriptures. Most men, and more as we get more and more through the coming of the Lord, are, don't have no idea who God is and who Jesus Christ is and is not being taught in the public schools. It's dying out from the prisons. God needs someone to go out to the lost people and say, this is what I expect from you. Now back to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I hope these studies are, are getting you going to go and get, get going. Romans 10, 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Well, how are they going to call? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, the next question we already read. How then shall they call upon him? Well, how are they going to do? Do you think the average lost man in the world is going to open up the Romans chapter 10 and, oh, okay, that's what I need to do. Absolutely not. He needs to be told. Going all the world, preach the gospel. Why? There are lost souls out there, and if they don't get saved, they are going to be condemned and brought into the lake of fire with dwelleth forever to be torments in that fire forever and if you do tell them they will be without excuse before God oh, I never knew but God will say hey listen this is the person I sent to you this is the ministry that I sent to you with that person and I sent others to you and without excuse no man at the great white throne judgment in the church age would be able to say, I never knew. Acts chapter 10, which we looked at last week, I believe. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And then we looked at this chapter. In Cornelius, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. That sounds like a good guy. It sounds like a guy who's got good works. There is none that doeth good. He saw in a vision about the ninth hour of the day an angel of the Lord coming into him, saying unto him, Cornelius, wow, he's got angels appearing to him. Well, the angels will do it. If I don't win, witness, God will send an angel. Muhammad saw an angel. Joseph Smith saw an angel. The Catholics see angels all the time. 
And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. That was great. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he's going to tell, you know, tell him what to do, and Peter's going to come, he's going to bring the gospel. Cornelius and all the good works and seeing an angel, he's lost. And what does the angel do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No. Oh, make toast after me. No. Make an idol to me. No. What does the angel do in the church age? Go get that preacher and bring him here. He's going to tell you what you need to do. You see, Romans 10, the lost needs a preacher. And even when an angel shows up, the angel says, go get the preacher. Mark 16 tells the Christians, go in all the world and preach the gospel. Matthew says, okay, you don't like preaching? Go teach the gospel. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts 8, 26. By the way, as I'm reading this, if your Bible does not have the complete what I'm reading to you, you need to get a new Bible. Modern versions mess with this. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Here's the angel. Sending Philip. The angel didn't go do it himself like Cornelius. He says, Philip, yes, sir. And we'll get to this chapter. Go in the world to preach the creature to preach the gospel to that Ethiopian eunuch. That's what it is. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Cadence, the queen of the Ethiopians who had the charge of all her treasures and had come to Jerusalem for the worship. Well, like Cornelius, they are worshiping God. And they're still lost. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, read, 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 Isaiah's the prophet. This guy's reading the Bible. You'd be lucky if you find somebody on the street like that. But you will. There'll be people tell you read the Bible. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Get over there, boy. Go. And Philip ran through to him and, ran, and heard him read. He's reading out loud. The prophet Isaiah and said, Understand that what thou readest? You understand. He said, How can I except some man should guide me? I need help with these scriptures. How do you like that? You think the angel of the Lord would be able to explain it, wouldn't he? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a, dumb, like a lamb dumb before his shears, so he opened not his mouth. And his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And it's talking about Jesus Christ. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee. Of whom speaketh the prophet of this? Of himself or some other man? And Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Go in all the world and preach the gospel. So here's another angel, not, at, not with the Ethiopian, but to the man of God saying, Hey, get over there and go tell them with the open Bible, preach to them. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter, you're going to get some messengers from Cornelius. Go over there and give them the scriptures. Give them Jesus Christ. This eunuch would go to hell. Cornelius would go to hell. If there was no men to be sent to him. Because an angel cannot do the job of a Christian. At all. So why do we go? 
Because the Bible says, go ye all in the world and preach the gospel. Isn't that enough? That the lost man has a living soul by a created God. That created God loves him and sent his son, Jesus, to suffer and die that we may have eternal life. And that soul that's in that man belongs to God. And God has the eternal destination for that man. He's either going to go to heaven by Jesus Christ or he's going to go to hell by anything else. That man with a body, spirit, and soul is going to die because of sin. And sinners cannot appear in the presence of God, for God is holy. John the Baptist told us that there is eternal life through, through the Son. There's eternal damnation without the Son. A heaven or hell. So we go out there, we go to lost men, we preach to them heaven or hell, never mind the cigarettes, never mind the dresses, no matter what sins they are involved in, if it's a gay parade or if it's this event, we preach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, how he may save you and your eternal soul, that your soul will not go to hell if you're to believe on Jesus Christ. That's it. We're taught that they need a preacher. Romans 10. And that preaching comes by the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Romans. There was an angel that went to a man. He said, I want you to go get a preacher. I am not going to preach to you. Go get Simon. There's an angel that showed up to Philip. I want you to go over there. I want you to teach that man. Both those men loved the Lord. Both those men were known by God. Both those men were doing things they were supposed to be. One's reading the Bible. The other one's praying, giving alms. And they were lost. And they needed a man to teach them what the Bible says about the saving grace of Jesus Christ and nothing else. That is why we are to have the public ministry set forth by God about the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing else. Nothing else. It's not what you think. It's not what you... And matter of fact, too, another thing, don't bring your church into soul winning. Don't bring that person to your pastor. Don't bring them to your church. Your pastor can't save them. Your church can't save them. You bring them to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is able to save them. Really, I mean, you got a lost man. You, you want your the churches today are filled with lost people. There are churches with plenty of lost people. We don't need lost people in churches. We need lost people to come to Jesus. Very rarely will I mention my church when I'm witnessing somebody. Because it's not about the church. And if they were to get saved, which is few. Remember we talked about, it is my responsibility to grow that Christian. Like Paul did with Peter. I mean, Timothy. Like Paul did with uh, Onassimus. And then you bring him to church. Saved. Not lost. We got a congregation of saved and lost people. Well, how are the lost people there? Oh, come to my church. Did you witness to him? No. No, you didn't do it. It's the pastor's job. It's the church's job. Really? Come on. You know better than that, don't you? You mean you're not going to... I mean, okay, you buy it in the church. I don't know what kind of credit you're going to get for that. But where you could witness to him with an open Bible, with a, a scriptural tract, and you have the ability and the application to... Lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ yourself. And you're like, oh, just come to church. I don't know. But why? Because God wants us to. How's that? Why? Because man has an eternal soul. Why? Because he's not going to come to God on his, on his own terms. He wants a God that's going to go to his terms. Why? Because that soul of that man is going to live for all eternity and he needs to hear what he must do to be saved. And if he gets saved, wonderful glory to God forever in 
to be with God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And if he were to go to hell, he has no excuse at all. If you've been faithful. If Christians would be faithful, there is no excuse. 